All right, welcome to the continuation of week five in high-risk pregnancy. Mm. Part three. Part three of high-risk pregnancy. Just trying to get, you know, a good view of yours truly. All right. <laughs> so there's plenty of things um, that can go wrong during a pregnancy. I mean, we normally, uh, you know, try to, try to uh, find the good in things, but honestly... There's uh, a lot of things that um, make a pregnancy high risk. We're going to talk about the medical conditions as opposed to yesterday when we talked more about the bleeding um, issues. Um, these are medical conditions either underlying or pregnancy induced. These are some of the conditions we're going to talk about um, and we'll talk in detail about each one. So the recurrent premature dilation of the cervix Unfortunately, this is found usually after the, at least the first loss of a pregnancy, and it's a little bit later in the pregnancy, like at the 16-week mark, maybe. Um, basically, I, this sounds harsh, but the baby basically falls out of the uterus because the, uter uh, the cervix starts opening. I mean, it's not exactly like that, but what happens is uh, the woman's cervix just can't support it, can't stay closed, and um, so she um, experiences a loss um, in the second, early second trimester. Sometimes it's just, oh, okay, a loss, she gets pregnant again and experiences another loss. But other, uh, sometimes it's also dis um, discovered when they do an exam, an ultrasound exam, and they find the cervix is already shortening in length. Um, and starting to open up went long before it should. Needless to say, for a variety, for a variety of reasons, um, some of which are excessive dilations, um, any sort of infection that may have um, ha uh, the patient may have had earlier, just, um, there are um, uh, some people who are at higher risk for this. Congenital structural defects. You know, stuff you don't know you have until you're called to use it. You said after one loss, there's generally another. So if they Could have be. this, it's, they're more predisposed to it? Well, so there's a, a loss. They may not have been looking for a problem with the cervix until they've had that loss. And then they still might not look for it just because one in four pregnancies end in loss. So they might get pregnant again, because they don't have problems getting pregnant, they have pre staying. problems staying pregnant. Um, so it may be after the second loss that they say, oh, we need to start looking at what's going on here. Um, it's not 100% that way, but I mean, that might be when, uh, you know, they start saying, well, if this, the two in a row at around this gestation, what's going on? And they might find this cervix is shorter or starting to open up uh, long before it should all right so what are we going to do um certainly manage the symptoms uh try to prevent them in the first place the pelvic pressure uh sometimes there's a gush of fluid it's just that cervix is just starting to open up um under the pressure of the uterus um i talked about the short cervix they'll find that um through a uh, transvaginal ultrasound. What we do is called a cervical cerclage. They take heavy ligature stitching and they literally sew the cervix shut. It's called purse strings. So they, I think I, there's a picture on the next slide. They stitch it and <coughs> tighten it like a, one of those old fashioned purses. Now uh, they're doing uh, makeup bags with that kind of from what I hear, or from what I see on Facebook, I don't have myself a makeup bag. Eh. They do this usually around the, uh, I would want to do it right after conception myself, but they will wait until the end of the first trimester, a little bit after that. Um, and then, um, you know, mom goes home on modified rest. Um, these folks are also on pelvic rest. Um, if we're already kind of behind the eight ball in terms of, um, uh, you know, precarious situation with the cervix, we're not going to be adding any, any further stress to the area. <coughs> this is what it looks like. Uh, it's called a McDonald's cerclage. It's purse string, so they 
they put the, the ligatures there and tighten it. Um, at about the 37th week, they will remove this stitching and get out of the way. <laughs> no, not, it, sometimes these patients go on to deliver um, post dates I know, after the fact, but not usually. Usually the service said thank God and comes on through. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. All right, it's obviously not a perfect system. If it was, we'd be saving a whole lot more pregnancies. Hyperemesis gravidarum. We talked way back about morning sickness, not way back, um, when we were talking about pregnancy. Morning sickness was not a good word for uh, description for many of us because the nausea and vomiting occurred far past the morning time. Um, and for some of us, it was just annoying. But for, for others of us, it's actually <laughs> debilitating and leading to um, dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. So um, we have to get it under control. And oh, and result 5% weight loss or more. That's the other um, part of the diagnosis. If mom is not being properly nourished, baby can't be properly nourished. So if, if left to kind of <coughs> wallow in the um, malnutrition and dehydration, it can lead to um, intrauterine growth restriction um, and preterm birth. Um, and well, we wanna avoid that as much as possible. Um, there are some risk factors, maternal age of less than 20. Um, so you remember that my twin sister had a baby when she was 19 years old. <coughs> she had hyperemesis, gra hyperemesis gravidera. Um, she also had a history of migraines. She was not uh, obese, but it was her first pregnancy. These, I, last night I talked about molar pregnancies, um, and they talked about the, the excessive amounts of HCG as being one of the reasons why the um, excessive nausea and vomiting occurred. Were you gonna say something? Um, psychosocial issues or high levels of stress can't be, can't be um, dismissed. I'm sure that adds to it, if not uh, relates to it. Um, we will get some thyroid um, levels um, because transient hyperthyroidism can also um, be a source. These women are, as I mentioned, they're not just dehydrated, so there's a fluid volume deficit by all means but their electrolytes could be off. And so they are admitted to the hospital where they um, are given <coughs> fluid and electrolyte uh, replacement. Uh, we have a cocktail of medications that might help with their nausea, um, and then we slowly reintroduce, reintroduce food um, into their system. I have had a patient um, spend uh, close to two months, I think, in-house with us on uh, total parental nutrition. So there were issues there. Not sure what, she was pretty sick of us by the time she delivered. Um, but she delivered a healthy baby and she herself uh, remained as healthy as possible um, during the whole thing. But they're clearly hypovolemic um, and whatnot there. So like I said, we just gotta, we just gotta treat uh, what's ailing them and hopefully help solve their nausea and vomiting. Um, back in the day, there was nothing we could give them um, and somebody came up and I'm not exactly sure how they figured this out, but um, vitamin B6 and Unisom, the over-the-counter sleep mm -hmm. medication, a, a combination of these two drugs three times a day and a certain, you know, half a dose here, half a dose there, full dose there, um, has taken care of it. Uh, eventually, uh, a drug company um, decided to market that, and Diclegis it came about. Diclegis, at this time, I believe, is the only FDA-approved medication for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a lot of patients came to rely on and still insist on Zofran, um, which is effective for many. Zofran a little controversial. It, there is actually no evidence uh, linking Zofran to 
fetal um, birth defects, but somewhere somehow yeah. it it did become linked to the possibility of like cleft lip and palate and something I else. Heard it, like a brief stage, like eeks. I don't know. I don't remember what they were, but I was told a certain period <coughs> in time throughout the pregnancy. There's like a certain number of weeks that it could affect them. Oh. So, so you know, if it's not an FDA-approved medication, and the doctor prescribes it, you can see where there might be a little trouble. So. Diclegis is um, a approved and um, insurance covers it and um, and it works for some but not all. Plain and simple. Anemia, um, fairly common actually. In It's not just about being a pregnant woman. It's about being a woman of childbearing age, I think, really what it boils down to. When they're pregnant, we're just checking for it. Um, so they might come to the pregnancy already um, on the low side in terms of her H&H. &H. Um, now, all of a sudden, her body is being asked to, do, to grow another human being, right? So um, her, the demand on her body increases. Um, sh her blood supply increases. And um, as I mentioned a few weeks back, Two-thirds of the extra blood supply that we produce during pregnancy is plasma. So the blood is diluted. Um, so if she's already a little low on red blood cells, uh, add two-thirds more plasma to the mix, um, she's definitely going to seem a bit more uh, anemic. We are a little bit, um, we're a little bit, we try to use that hemodilution as a reason why we would not jump on the anemia bandwagon until um, her count, her hemoglobin is less than 11 versus 12. Um, but nonetheless, we will give um, mom some iron, um, talk about dietary iron, that sort of thing. Um, does, pregnancy doesn't take away the symptoms of anemia, whether it's fatigue, irritability, high pulse, shortness of breath, dizziness, um, pale, paleness, uh, brittle nails, that sort of thing. Um, the challenge is that iron is not easy on that stomach, is it? Uh, constipation. Constipation is huge. And it's, constipation is already a problem in pregnancy. Um, so if we... We have to worry about the side effects of the of the over-the-counter iron um, and compliance in treating it. A lot of women are, are certainly concerned that their baby is um, also anemic. Um, we can unless in unless there's extreme cases of malnutrition and, and anemia, a baby will uh, leech off mom's iron stores and actually um, not uh, have a problem at all, it's the mom who suffers a bit. Um, so ferrous sulfate um, is the drug of choice. There are some slow, slow FE, there's some different kinds of drugs that may be a little milder on the belly. Um, colace is something we can give um, a pregnant woman and I like to uh, make sure they know they can take both, um, that's preferable to getting all bound up. There's certain things, you know, we, we know that um, orange juice um, enhances the absorption or vitamin C. So some docs want a vitamin C supplement and an iron and a colase all, all together. There's certain um, foods that um, get in the way of absorption, which, uh, which is, oops, sorry, dairy in particular. Um, comes to mind, red meat and a couple other things. So the timing of their um, consumption needs to be considered. All right, gestational diabetes. Um, I guess before I talk about the, the, the whys and what's of gestational diabetes, it's important to know that one minute, an otherwise young, healthy woman is young and healthy. And after one doctor's appointment or one phone call, she's not. 
right? That doesn't mean that, did you have diabetes? Did somebody, did, you did, yeah. Um, so there, it doesn't mean that she's sick, but all of a sudden she's having to check her own sugar four times a day, maybe take insulin, follow a certain diet, have extra, a whole bunch of extra appointments. Things are talked about in terms of risk for baby. I mean, like, all I did was show up for my 28 week labs, and then this happened, you know what I mean? Some women ex exhibit symptoms of hyper or hypoglycemia and are finally, oh, that's why I'm feeling a little bit lousy, but generally, they were feeling just fine. <laughs> so, so we have to be sensitive to the, to the fact that it's, it may not be a big deal for the medical community. Yep, we're going to get this under control. Everything's fine. But it's a big darn deal for that patient, all right, um, and a major lifestyle change for many. With that in mind, uh, the, the definition of gestational diabetes certainly impaired glucose tolerance uh, recognized during pregnancy. Um, Normal blood glucose is between 70 and 110, basically. Um, and we are, unlike anemia, where we are a little bit more relaxed with those numbers, we are not at all relaxed. I think they, for my last one, uh -huh. they changed, so it wasn't the one time. I think St. Francis, the, like the, what did they call it to say? Can't remember. Mm -hmm. But it was, I think, 100. For fasting blood glucose? Yeah. Um, I mean, it could have even been 95 or better. I was going to say, I think it could. Yeah. I know every time I went back, I was like, what the hell? It was fine the last time. Yeah. But they kept making, like, they Yeah, they're here, really, was, really tightening the yeah. control of um, glucose. Because evidence shows that the tighter the control and the lower the blood glucose, the fewer risks to fetus. All right? I think I said during class, I had an aunt who's who's gone now, but... She lost her baby at 40 weeks, um, and she was a severe diabetic in her, in her eight, eight, older age. I'm sure she was gestational diabetic, maybe undiagnosed back then. Um, problems with the baby, plain and simple, and we want to avoid them. And if we can avoid them by taking that nice, tight control, then we're going to do everything we can um, to do that. Um, if it is truly gestational diabetes, the minute that placenta detaches from the, the uterine wall, diabetes is over. We'll probably just do one more follow-up um, blood glucose at the six-week mark, a tolerant, glucose tolerance test. Um, that, it's hard to comply with that one. There's not a high level of compliance with patients coming back for that glucose tolerance test because the baby's out and they're no longer motivated. Um, they say that uh, it's a pretty high chance of, even if it's gestational diabetes, there's a pretty high chance that the woman will go on to have diabetes um, a little bit later in life. All right, so plenty of risk factors um, to the fetus, uh, include, up to and including death. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal. Oh, Spontaneous abortion. Okay. Yeah. So some women... Um, some women are borderline diabetic. That's why we, uh, we look at risk factors. So if we have a high BMI, and each, pro, you know, the, each practice might have their own guidelines. Um, but if it's a high, pretty high BMI, we'll probably get a hemoglobin A1C with our initial prenatal labs. If that's elevated, we're gonna move on this diabetes thing sooner. But what we're finding is it's not gestational diabetes, it's underlying type two diabetes. Um, that we just caught because she's seeking medical care with a pregnancy. Um, again, an elevated BMI, if uh, maybe not too elevated, above 30 perhaps, um, is getting an early one hour glucose challenge test or yeah, glucose challenge test at 16 weeks. Um, just because they are at higher risk for diabetes uh, that we might actually just find um, not related to a pregnancy at that point. Uh, otherwise, it's at the 28-week mark, we are um, testing everyone. Doesn't matter what their BMI, doesn't matter what their age, doesn't matter what their family history is, everyone gets a glucose challenge test at the 28-week mark. Um, I like, not like, but the risk factors, obviously obesity, um, above the age of 25. Oh. Is that for the first baby or any pregnancy? Uh, I don't know. It seems like a 
seems like pretty much than everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Except for maybe the 20 year olds. They have their own risk factors, but I don't know. Family history of diabetes, uh, previous delivery of a large for gestational age infant or stillborn. Sometimes it's an unexplained 40 week stillborn. Um, you know, we're gonna put, we're gonna be on higher alert um, looking for looking for the um, risk factors uh, that may have led to that um, late term um, stillborn. Like I said, they may be having hypo or hyperglycemic symptoms, but they might not. So it's pretty hard to motivate a lot of these patients. You have to actually say, your baby could die. Yep. And they usually pretty uh, compliant after that. Um, so we'll do the one hour glucose challenge test and um, from there move very quickly, may move very quickly to the three hour glucose challenge test if they don't pass. At one hour, a 50 gram sugar load, on, after one hour uh, we would want a blood sugar to be um, less, a lot, now we're moving it down a little bit, I would say. I, the reason I put 130 to 140 is because it is changing, it seems daily. It used to be 140. Um, before I left that office, um, it was down to 135. So who knows what it is now, but according to ATI, it's still, I think, 135 to 140. So they fail the one hour, we get the three hour. Um, from there, if they fail two out of three of the blood draws after the three hour glucose challenge test, they're diabetic. <coughs> we send them straight to the nutritionist, straight to the nurse um, to learn how to monitor her own sugar. And all of a sudden, boom, she's full blown, checking her sugar four times a day, um, trying to control it with diet. Uh, we'll, we'll let her try to control it with diet for a very short period of time, one week. One week we give her to try to figure it out. And if those levels are not um, in control with one, within one week, boom, they're on insulin. And sometimes we're doing an oral um, agent um, now, but insulin um, they do, injectable. They hmm? do oral for gestational diabetes? Yeah, now they do. The problem is it's not, uh, it's not easy to pinpoint. So with the injectable insulin, mm -hmm. we can pinpoint. So say it's just your fasting glucose that is slightly elevated. We're gonna give a long-acting insulin at night to take care of that fasting glucose. Whereas the um, oral agent might not have that much pinpoint control. Um, so it's still um, injectable insulin is, probably, is you, you know, oftentimes the way to go. Do they use, um, I'm sorry, do they use metformin? Um, it is, I think or it's on the next slide. Is that glucophage? Is that oh, metformin? Okay. Metformin, yeah, that's metformin. Yeah. Glad you're right. Um, one of them is completely um, against, I mean, it, it can harm the fetus, but yeah. Glad has now been shown to okay. have some good effects. So, um, is that the results for the. Okay, so those are the reasons nah, that, don't worry about all that. That's too much detail. Nonetheless, uh, we're gonna get them. We're gonna get them under control. Did I pass, did I miss the? Oh no, here it is. All right, so we're gonna get them in as much control very quickly as possible, um, for her own health, but more importantly for the baby, the baby's health. All right. Um, we know that uh, we can probably detect early signs of trouble. Um, so we're bringing them in at least twice a week in the third trimester for non-stress tests, for biophysical profiles. We are keeping very strict control of her diet and blood sugar and her meds. Um, but we are being very vigilant on that uh, with that baby. Um, and the first sign of trouble, boom, we're getting that baby out because we know that trouble continues, it can lead to fetal death. First, got it for my first son. Mm -hmm. I had the non-stress test, the amnio. Like it was basically a whole hospital day. Mm -hmm. They, I met with the nutritionist. 
they gave me, so then they actually feed you there, mm -hmm. then they check your sugar after. I was on Lantus, like they showed you how to administer it. Yeah, it was they like, were not messing around with you. No, and then I would be, so then I had more doctor appointments mm -hmm. at my doctor on the fetal monitor. Right. They did echoes on the, all three of my mm -hmm. boys before they were even born, like, and I had more frequent ultrasounds. Yeah. Like, I think I had ultrasounds. Weekly. Every, yeah. Was, what you was, were getting was a biophysical profile. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. All right. So once a week, it was just a non-stress test. Okay. And the other appointment that week was a non-stress test with a biophysical right. profile. Okay. Yeah. yeah we're awesome. keeping very close tabs on that baby. Um, and we will, we will evict at the first sign of trouble, okay. more or less. All right. Um, we're also um, educating mom on what she can do at home um, to ensure the well-being of her fetus, including kick counts. Um, and certainly staying within control um, with their diet and blood sugars. Exercise is always a good thing. Keep things under control. So the monitoring uh, four times a day, as I mentioned, um, I think important to, to remember is that uh, fasting glucose, we want 95 milligrams or below, all right, for a fasting glucose. And we're having two hour postprandials. And we want the two hour to be 120 milligrams or below, milligrams per deciliter. Postprandial, post two hours. After oh. Two hours after? Oh, two hours, sorry, sorry, I thought you were teasing me. No, I wasn't. Um, two hours after a meal, yep. That's even like lower than a regular person, isn't it? It is. Oh, okay. Yep. It is. They are. It is. We are much. We are much stricter with pregnancy because we know its effects on that baby. <clears throat> Glucometers, all that. Sometimes it's a lot to um, take in for, uh, especially somebody who has no medical background at all. It doesn't matter. It's. I mean, nurse or not, it still sucks to all of a sudden be healthy one minute and sick the next. Um, even though what, all we're doing is to try to prevent problems. But nonetheless, it is still um, an emotional time for a lot of um, patients. All right, so um, just as we're testing, we're now we're going to target the blood sugars that we don't like. Um, so oftentimes, four different injections also are added to the mix um, um, in managing the diabetes, all right? Um, again, if it's a fasting glucose um, issue, we're going to give the NPH or Lenti at bedtime um, and the short-acting short um, insulins during the day um, to manage the two-hour postprandials. The oral hypoglycemics, they really um, the, uh, have, we never used to give them at all, but we have found that gliburide does um, cross the placenta and seems to... to uh, it does not, excuse me. Okay. And um, it actually What's works. What's the other name for that? The like... Glucophage. Glucophage? Isn't that gliburide? No. Glucophage is, is, is metformin. Yeah. Gliburide... Is that actos? I think so. Oh, I don't know. I I actually, so. Glucophage and metformin are the same. Yeah. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I ever heard of a, another name for there gliburide. Is. All right, you find out. You figure it out and, and yell it out when you... Um, when you got it. Okay. All right. <laughs> we move on to gestational hypertension. Glinase. What is it? Glinase. Glinase. I've never heard of that. Um, okay. Hi gestational hypertension. Um, for those who got to watch the ER episode, which all of you have, um, hypertension can, as you can tell, cause quite a bit of trouble, right? Um, there's, there's a a whole spectrum of trouble, um, starting with just a mild hypertension with no problems, leading and up to clearly the worst of troubles. So, it all depends on the end organ effects. Is hypertension synonymous with eclampsia? No, no. Oh, but we'll talk about that, I promise. So hypertension, um, it can as I mentioned before, sometimes a woman coming to for prenatal visits, it very well might be the first time as an adult 
she saw any health care, right? So uh, we might find an underlying hypertension issue simply because somebody's taking her blood pressure, all right? So she might add, so if we see this hypertension um, before the 24th week of pregnancy, most likely it's an underlying hypertension that she had when she first came in, uh, before she got pregnant, all right? But it's the end organ effects that we're really, really concerned about. Um, and we'll talk about each one of those. Mild gestational hypertension um, is simply that, hypertension, okay? Mild and severe preeclampsia gets, we're getting a little more serious, eclampsia, HELP syndrome. Those are the ones that we'll talk about. The primary mechanism that is the problem is the vasospasms. The vasospasms leads to poor perfusion. Initially, we're thinking poor perfusion of kidneys, poor perfusion of the brain, all right? Those are mom problems, but there's also poor perfusion of placenta, and that becomes the baby problem. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, as I mentioned, gestation, if we want to call it gestational <coughs> hypertension, it's after the, okay, 20, 20th week, all right? Um, and there's some guidelines about, like, what we consider actual hypertension. I always want to know what the baseline blood pressure is. Because if somebody came to me with her baseline blood pressure of 95 over 62, um, then it, it, all of a sudden it's 132 over 88. That might be significant for her, but not for somebody else. So, you know, no matter what pregnancy or not, um, always know what a person's baseline blood pressure is while making decisions about them. So mild preeclampsia. So we have some hypertension with a little bit of protein, a little bit of protein spilling into the urine, all right? They might have some um, transient um, headaches, uh, maybe some edema, but that's about it. So the transient headaches, the protein, I'm starting to worry about these vasospasms just causing a hint of trouble with their neural system and their kidneys, right? Then we get to severe preeclampsia. Now we're talking very high blood pressure. Protein in the urine is quite abundant, leading to nearly kidney failure, okay? Increased creatinine, um, some have oliguria, like they, they're not even producing urine anymore, all right? Cerebral and visual disturbances. These are the ones who come to us saying, nothing I am doing is taking care of this headache. And it's not a, just a, a little bit of a, an annoying headache. It's a migraine, like I don't even wanna see the lights on kind of headache, all right? Uh, visual disturbances, uh, not just blurred vision, but like spots in front of their eyes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Guess what, those vasospasms are leading to some major neuro um, symptoms, right? We might have, um, uh, not might, at most likely you're gonna have um, very brisk um, deep tendon reflexes. Like you don't hardly even have to touch, you don't even need a reflex hammer. You just, I'm, I, I'm doing it on the arm, but you just like touch the reflex and whoosh, they're really, they're, you know, like very, very brisk. Uh, the legs, you know, you get out of the way because they'll kick you um, when you tap on their knee for the reflexes. Um, so they're wound tighter and tighter and tighter because that neural system is just, um, having um, some major uh, perfusion issues. Um, clonus is an, interesting, is an interesting thing that probably, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of what clonus is. Clonus is the, um, so you have a woman laying on her, um, you know, on her back or, or with her feet up um, and you ask her to just relax her legs, her feet, and then you press on her foot, you flex your foot up and just let it fall while still kind of, you know, holding on. And a positive clonus, we count how many times her feet like flutter down. They won't even just fall back down 
uh, without a struggle. She is wound so tight that it like stutters down like that. So we count how many stutters and that's, you know, like two beats of clonus. It's two stutters down before it. Yeah, this woman is about to blow. She's about to seize on us, all right? Um, we also ask about um, right upper quadrant pain, um, epigastric pain, and that is actually a pretty angry liver, all right? Yeah. There might be some thrombocytopenia too, so that's uh, low platelet levels, okay? Eclampsia is when all that leads to what we're afraid of, and that's all of that with seizure activity and coma, or, and or coma. Help syndrome is pretty much all of that, but then you add in um, some hemolysis um, and elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. So it's got more of the um, liver involvement. You can see gestational hypertension piled on top of underlying um, chronic hypertension. So uh, that kind of, kind of stinks, yeah. That's okay. So would it be, so why would it be gestational hypertension if it was the chronic, if they already have the hypertension to the um, So they have a little hypertension, it becomes a more hypertension, plus we start adding all the, other all the protein and the neuro symptoms and stuff okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, good question. All right, um, so we talked about tissue perfusion and how it affects Mom, well, tissue perfusion to the placenta can cause um, some major issues for a baby as well, uh, especially if it's been chronic. So we might not have an, an emergency situation like they did on that ER episode. We could have, we can diagnose this gestational hypertension in the third trimester, you know, early in the third trimester, and we start, we start keeping track of it um, and we're watching that baby because we are watching that placenta. Is, it, is there a perfusion issue with the placenta? If there is a perfusion issue with the placenta, how is baby handling it? And we will intervene the minute we see trouble. Um, we might, we're in the meantime, we are getting her hypertension under control. There are um, some oral meds, uh, labetalol comes to mind, um, that we can give to our patients to try to get that um, hypertension under control, all right? The other issue is the coursing of that blood with the high blood pressure, right? And the vasospasms can um, blow that placenta right off the uterine wall. And we talked about placental abruption last night on that ER video. Um, that's what happened to uh, that patient. Um, so um, that's another issue. We could get all the way through pregnancy and then right at the end, they all go to hell in a handbasket. All right. Um, this just goes through mild to bad stuff <laughs> and what kind of gets added to the problem as you um, go down the continuum. Do we need to, like, know the numbers and stuff? Or the no. Between no. Severe? Um, you're going to need to um, mm -hmm. just think about, uh, this is how I want to put it. If we were familiar with certain things, if we were familiar with that protein in the urine, if we were familiar with the neuro signs, if we were familiar with all of that, really feel very strongly about that, that patient on the ear episode may have had a better outcome, all right? So I want high level, but um, high level knowledge of it, not down to the 140 over 90, this, to, you know, in four to six hours, you need to know all that business, but thinking about poor tissue perfusion and how it can affect all of our body systems as well as the placenta and baby. Um, pathophysiology, for some, they just like the chart to kind of get you um, more um, familiar with the, you know, the process of why it can get really out of control. There's your basal spasm pictures. What are the risk factors? 
Maternal age, less than 20, above 40. My twin, at 19, had herself severe preeclampsia. Headache, uh, she was, uh, the, did I tell you guys this? No. She was, uh, she went to, the, she was in Charleston, West Virginia, a college student, having a baby. She uh, was at the doctor's office, or the clinic, uh, where she sought care. Um, they didn't like, she was, had, she recalls not peeing much. Guess what was happening, right? Her kidneys were shutting down. She recalls a migraine-like headache. Um, she recalls, you know, getting her what urine she could give them tested, and that her blood pressure was was high. And they sent her on a city bus uh -oh. to go to the hospital. <laughs> they just they said you need to go to the hospital. Well, they didn't. Either she didn't hear it, or she didn't want to hear it. She didn't realize how serious it was. So she got back on the city bus to go home, um, where she went, she went home, um, because she didn't want to go to the hospital by herself. Um, I'm glad I didn't know. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't know what I was doing then. I'm glad I didn't know of the circumstances. Just think of what could have happened. She could be laying on the apartment floor right now, not now, 30 years ago, um, in a coma. Um, but she, she's the one that had the nausea and vomiting? Yes, she wow, did. Bloody. Yep. And in fact... She must not have liked being pregnant. <laughs> um, it's, not it's not one of those things, but we have seen a lot of the same First risk pregnancy. factors yeah. mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. hyperemesis yeah. as we do for, um, yeah. for hypertension. So uh, she got herself um, eventually to the hospital where she was on magnesium sulfate. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that. Her kidneys were indeed shutting down, um, and she was scolded for not giving them urine. Magnesium sulfate comes down the vaso. Vasospasm, yeah. So um, we'll talk about that, I think, next. I saw that on the show. Yeah. So, yeah, we're gonna see some of this stuff. The liver might be so bad, we might see some jaundice and the, the like, yeah. Um, we're going to draw all the labs to, to see uh, what's being affected. Um, we might uh, see the hemolysis and the low platelets and the um, elevated liver enzymes and stuff like that. Is it? Yeah. Um, and really check that urine uh, for protein. We are, uh, as I mentioned, um, going to keep a close eye on that baby throughout. And off, most times, some preeclampsia or some, you know, mild preeclampsia, we can manage medically um, and, and maybe bring her in for induction a little bit early <laughs> if the placenta starts showing signs of wear and tear. Um, but generally, if we can keep that blood pressure under control, um, we can do okay. All right? It's when it just gets way out of control that uh, we spiral downward in the process. So, um, as I mentioned, we could start with some, um, some PO meds, nifedipine, uh, labetalol. I see that one given most often. Uh, ACE inhibitors are n completely contraindicated, okay? Um, the beta blockers, I guess, that we can give. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, now we have... Um, the seizure issue, right? We want to prevent a seizure. What we're wanting to do, so uh, we'll bring these people in, we'll put them on magnesium sulfate. If the labetalol is not taking care of the, uh, the blood pressure and we start seeing neural signs increasing, boom, we bring them in, we get them on, um, we get them on magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate, we put them on that to, because it's a smooth muscle relaxer, and it, smooth, it hopefully um, decreases the vasospasms, all right? It will decrease um, all the smooth muscles. Hopefully not too much. <laughs> so that's where we, the delicate balance is a pretty powerful drug we're giving. We're giving a four gram loading dose and down to two grams uh, an hour it's following that. IV? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So we're watching them very carefully. They are put, uh, they're put a Foley in. We're watching urine output. We want it to be at least 30 milliliters an hour. Um, anything less than that's reportable. Uh, we're checking DTRs, we're checking respiratory rate, we're checking oxygen levels, we're checking level of consciousness, we're checking all of these things very frequently. Yes? Does this affect the baby and make him sleep or him or her sleep? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, so the magnesium sulfate is used to prevent seizures, plain and simple, mm -hmm. right, in this case. Well, turns out, with the smooth muscle relaxation, and the decreasing vasospasm to prevent the seizure, it also decreases your blood pressure, which is a nice side effect. That's not why we're doing it, but it's a nice, I mean, it's a nice side effect. Um, but as I mentioned, it's a pretty powerful drug that, um, that could lead to the opposite effect. So um, somebody could relax just a tad bit too much and go into respiratory failure. So we're catching them. We're doing mag levels, which, the, the lab always says, ah, they call up like, no, nah, this is way too high of a mag level, but its therapeutic range is between four and seven. Um, so yes, it's high, but that's where we want it. Um, but we were watching everything very carefully. And if the first sign of uh, like absent DTRs, uh, uh, their uh, urine output less than 30, a decreased level of consciousness, all that stuff, whoop, we, what's the first thing we're gonna do? turn off the magnesium sulfate, all right? I have never had to, I've had to turn off magnesium sulfate, but I've never had to give the antidote to magnesium sulfate, which is calcium gluconate. Really, really important to know um, that calcium gluconate has to be on hand. I kept it in my pocket. When I took care of magnesium sulfate patients, it stayed in my pocket, all right? Some kept it up on the uh, monitor shelf in the, in the room, that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted it on my person because maybe one in there too, but it's a medication that you shouldn't just leave laying around. Um, I wanted it right where I needed it. What is DTR stand for? Deep, Deep tendon, tendon reflex. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank no, you. that's okay. So if they're on magnesium sulfate, do we continue the antihypertensive or not all of it? Um, it's just a, it's going to be a- Case specific? Yeah. They might stay on it um, because uh, magnesium's not enough. Not right. Magnesium's not the thing. I mean, we're doing that to prevent the seizures. Right. So we might have to skip a dose based on what the blood pressure is. But <coughs> this is not a long-term therapy. Usually, this is we're getting them stable and then delivering them. You know, we don't we don't start magnesium sulfate in the hospital um, willy nilly. You know, we're. We're pretty serious at this point. We're not going to let this person go home. So the, um, the ER show, they mm -hmm. giving her Valium as well? I mean, yeah. So is there, would you give the mag sulfate over Valium? Or no, no, no. Magnesium them? sulfate is given to prevent okay. seizures. To prevent seizures. All right. Once yes, we are, once she has a seizure, we can give Valium. Okay. Yeah. We can give Valium to stop the seizures, yep. okay. all right, because we don't want seizures. Right. We will we'll also be starting magnesium sulfate to Regard. prevent so further seizures. Oh, right. okay. Valium okay. can be given because we want to stop the seizure okay. because a seizure not only can harm the adult patient, um, it can also blow that placenta off the uterine wall and, and cause huge issues um, with the pregnancy. And the Valium crosses to the baby as well? Maybe so. Okay. But um, yeah, it is. It's an. It's yeah. It's it's a pretty serious, um, pretty serious issue. Oh, we're gonna fluid restrict um, mom as well. Um, yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty serious issue, overall. But as I mentioned, calcium gluconate. Gonna have that on hand. First thing we do, stop the mag. Easiest thing, right? Let's let's go with the easy first. Stop the mag. Give the calcium gluconate. Um, so what we're really doing is preventing cardiac arrest. You know that smooth muscle relaxer? You know that whole muscle there? That in the heart shape right about around here area? Yeah, we don't want that going. We don't want that going down, right? Can you see okay? Yeah, there? All right. I have the slides in front of me. All right, good. <clears throat> Discharge instructions? Uh, these patients who probably aren't going home anytime soon. 
Uh, but if we get it under control um, and they're still early on in the, in the labor, they might end up going home on labetalol. Sometimes they come in with the issue. We start them on magnesium sulfate. We add the labetalol and they can continue with their pregnancy. But, um, generally, um, that's not the case. Let's, if it's neural symptoms, wound tight, let's shut everything down. Quiet environment, darkened room, left lateral. Right, we want that blood flow to be as, as uh, optimal as possible to the um, placenta. Yeah, I came in to uh, pick up my paycheck back before direct deposit. I was a couple weeks uh, from my due date. I was already out on leave. Um, I was feeling kind of lousy that day, a little bit of a headache. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I just wasn't feeling great. It was hot. It was the August, hottest August on record, second hot. Hottest, right? Didn't you deliver in August as well? July, July 31st. July 31st, okay. So no, we had I remember that, that was okay. August because my mom was pregnant the same August oh, that's as what, you were. Okay. And... That sort of thing. Yeah. So anyways, um, I was feeling lousy. My, I, my eyes were puffy. Um, and it turns out I could feel my pulse. I felt like I could feel my pulse through my eyes. Mm. All right, nurse. Libby. <laughs> right? What's happening there? They're going to pick up my paycheck. Um, and uh, they go, oh, you don't look so good. I say, yeah, I don't really feel all that good. You know, I just feel kind of lousy. Uh, your, your eyes are all puffy. Yeah, I know. I feel like I can feel my pulse through my eyes. Oh. <laughs> they brought me to the... <laughs> they brought me to the... Um, monitor. Yeah, the monitor. Uh, they didn't put me on the monitor, but they did take my blood pressure. And we're laughing. I'm just sitting in a chair. As they're taking it, and I'm kind of rolling my eyes, blah, 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 blah. and it was 200 something over 110. Yeah, and the laughter stopped, and the lights went off. They made me lay down on my side um, and said, We'll be back in 20 minutes. Call me, call if you start feeling worse. I'm like, Oh, shoot. <laughs> was it dehydrated or something? Or? I, that must have been, it, yeah. it was transient. Yeah. Um, 20 okay. minutes later, they checked my blood pressure and it was fine. Wicked high to be honest. Yeah, especially because my twin sister had such trouble, uh, you know, four years earlier, uh, five years earlier. Anyways, we got the quiet environment. We tried to, you know, they were not pleased with me. <laughs> At all, I mean, you know, they were very concerned. Nobody laughed after that. Does that happen with twins? I know this is completely unrelated. I, I'm not sure if there's any... Um, Higher incidence with twins? Okay. Family history. Family history was one of the things? Yeah. Oh, oh, you mean twins? I thought you meant no, no, me no. and my twin. Is that what you meant? Or if no, you no, have no. pregnant no, with twins? You oh, yeah. The Family the history then, yeah. Oh, I thought okay. you meant if you're pregnant with twins. Great, great. My twin and I are, are no more genetically related than my older sister and I. Okay. Oh, okay. I mean, I like to think we are very much bonded closely, but... We are emotionally, but genetically, okay. it, we're fraternal twins, so okay. there's no... Would it make a difference for identical twins? Because they Maybe. Have Maybe so. Okay. Yeah. Depending on what the risk factors are, you know, that brought, led them to that point, yeah. who knows? Okay. But family history, yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> I thought you just meant if you're pregnant with twins. Right. Um, so as I mentioned before, with all of these things, our goal is to deliver as safe, as, as, as safely as possible, a healthy baby to a healthy mother, right? So we're going to manage symptoms. We're going to optimi optimize, op optimize, optimize blood flow to the placenta. We're going to be very vigilant and watch to make sure um, that placenta and baby remain as healthy as possible. Okay, and that requires the non-stress tests and the biophysical profiles and all of those things. All right, sometimes, and I, I don't know if this is on the next slide or not. Eh. No, I mean, that's pretty much what we were said before. When they do get to go home, we are asking them to rest. Um, though bed rest is controversial, all right? Bed rest leads to, I think this is the next slide. Stress. No. More stress. Right? So when they might be dipping their urine and weighing themselves daily. If they gain more than a pound in a week, um, we're worried about uh, edema um, and taking on fluids. Maybe kidneys <coughs> not working so well, that sort of thing. All right. 
<clears throat> but the bed rest, uh, the bed rest hasn't really been proven to be all that effective, if anything. When you're in bed, yes, have um, rest periods. Left lateral position, we know, um, increases blood flow. Um, it's an optimal blood flow to the placenta as well as helping with the return of blood from the lower um, limbs to um, the heart. Uh, so maybe it keeps blood pressure down a bit that way. Um, but <laughs> they're already stressed out, right? I love this picture because this pretty much says it for me. Um, you got uh, family to, to be taken care of. You are scared because you're not feeling well and you're afraid for your baby and all sorts of things. And then you're told you can't get out of bed. Oh, that's not very helpful. You know what I mean? So it actually might counter our, our intent is to keep things under control by increasing the stress on the family and the individual. So yeah, we're, we're, we're keeping a close darn eye on them when they're in the hospital doing all those uh, checks, um, at least hourly. Uh, <coughs> a quick, a quick um, note on, so we get their blood pressure somewhat under control, but we're keeping them on magnesium sulfate. And now uh, it's under control, but we have decided it's time to take the baby. It's time to induce labor um, with this woman. So she's on magnesium sulfate, and then we start the Pitocin. Pitocin is a, um, will contract a uterus. Magnesium sulfate is a smooth muscle relaxer. So basically, it's magnesium sulfate in one IV, Pitocin in another, and they are like battling it out at the uterus. <laughs> so generally, they need a whole lot more Pitocin to counteract the smooth muscle relaxant uh, effects of the uh, magnesium sulfate. So it's quite a, it's quite a um, battle in there. It's a war zone. And then you have a baby born um, who has magnesium sulfate on board. So the hypotonia, uh, you know, they are um, pretty relaxed um, to the point where they might not breathe. Huh? That would affect their Afghar. That absolutely can affect their Afghar. Um, their tone will be most likely decreased. Um, they may have trouble breathing spontaneously. Um, it's a fairly short half-life, so we just have to get it out of their system, support the baby until... And we're aware that that might be an issue, so we're ready for it. We're ready for it anyways, but we have probably pediatrics in the room for the delivery, whether it be C-section or uh, vaginal delivery, um, so that they can help us support the baby while the magnesium sulfate gets out of their system. So if the mom has mag sulfate on board and Pitosa, uh -huh. how does she feel after all Oh, that? the magnesium sulfate, the they're already feeling lousy, okay. plain and simple, right? When they get come in with this problem. Okay. Then we throw magnesium sulfate on board. Magnesium sulfate makes them feel lousy. Okay. First of all, they feel lousy anyways, but the flushed feeling, they, they're very like, whoa. Okay. Yeah, they feel pretty lousy. Okay. Yeah, it's not a fun room to be in, I gotta tell you. Because, <laughs> oh, quiet, dark, like, it's not, it kind of, unfortunately, takes, takes a lot of the uh, joy and celebration out of the, the anticip and anticipation out of the room, but obviously, our first and foremost goal is to provide safe delivery of a healthy mom and baby. So we'll celebrate afterwards, but in the meantime, yeah. This preeclampsia or in pregnancy-induced hypertension, gestational hypertension, however you want to put it, um, can stick around, all right? Um, it can stick around until after delivery. In fact, it can rear its ugly head after delivery. Um, we have had women come in uh, to the emergency room with a headache and be quite hypertensive after the gave birth. After the birth. So mm -hmm. sort of like with gestational diabetes with a greater chance to turn to regular diabetes? Can I don't know, probably. But this is considered gestational, even within the two weeks after um, birth. Mm -hmm. so it's considered six gestational. Weeks, right? Six weeks? They give up to six weeks. Okay. It is a long time. It's the first two weeks that are pr pretty crucial. Uh, uh, a girl from my hometown uh, was found dead in her bed. Uh, from a major fry. They, I don't know what the 
end result was in terms of autopsy, but I, it was related to her hypertension. Ooh, um, so it was any, maybe a stroke right. or a aneurysm of some sort. It says return to baseline in five, six weeks. Oh, return to baseline in five, six weeks. Yeah. It is, sometimes they don't have, we don't pick up on, or it, it doesn't uh, become evident during their pregnancy, but after. after, which is why follow-up is so important for these patients. It's, after I gave birth to my first son, mm -hmm. I was fine my pregnancy mm -hmm. without this. Never had a blood pressure issue. Mm -hmm. The minute I gave birth, my blood pressure was sky high. And they ended up having to start me on medication for it. Mm -hmm. Except I was like younger, didn't know that I could be on the label. Yeah. And so they put me on metoprolol, mm -hmm. and like you can't breastfeed mm -hmm. with metoprolol. So I think they gave me something IV first because mm -hmm. I still I had the C-section. And so I breastfed him for I think like two weeks and then when I went for my follow-up with my regular mm -hmm. doctor, they switched. And it's like, yeah, it was crazy. The headache was, I thought I wanted to put my head through a window. Yeah. It was crazy, it was so painful. Yeah. And nothing like would get rid of it because- the mag They might have been giving you magnesium exactly. sulfate in, okay. your, <laughs> I, in your IV, especially if you had that severe yeah. headache. Yeah. They didn't want you seasoned on them. Okay. Yeah. I got you a troublemaker during your pregnancy. Can you do it again? Stop it, right? No, no. Remember, we're being recorded. Uh, early onset labor. So we move on to other issues. Uh, baby wants to make an appearance long before we want him or her to, right? Um, the issue is, you know, some people have those Braxton Hicks contractions and stuff. And we got it. The issue is differentiating between Braxton Hicks or false labor and true labor. Um, we can't take these complaints um, lightly. They say, I'm having cramping. Well, <clears throat> yeah, but blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? It could be early onset labor, for crying out loud. So initially, we have to investigate. Now, when I, we're always investigating, but we're telling them to lay down, drink fluids, you know, change the activity. We're asking her to do all these things, but initially we're gonna figure out if this, these complaints of cramping are, are what, are, what are we, what's the differentiator? Cervical it's changes. Cervical. cervical changes, that's the key, right? And we don't wanna wait too long, because if we can catch it and stop it, then we can move on to have a, a normal length uh, pregnancy. So how long would you wait to, for them to actually? Eh, you know, I guess it depends. I, I, I know that um, I would triage the call, <coughs> saying, well, how, what do they feel like? Are you having, you know, ask about other symptoms, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Lay down for an hour, drink fluid. You know, mm -hmm. like I'd go through all the, the stuff. The stuff. Have mm -hmm. you been drinking enough fluid? Well, yes, well, how much is enough, you know? <laughs> Um, enough is like two of those, all right? So we're talking a large amount of fluid. Um, and so we'll go through that. Um, sometimes it's bringing them right in. Some, because we're trying to tell these patients all the time, drink plenty of fluid, rest, fre you know, rest frequently. If you're feeling this way, change your activity. I mean, lay down for a little while, drink some fluid, you know, that sort of thing. So some patients are already calling, I already did that, and I'm still having them. Well, then come on in. Um, so, it all, it's case by case, but um, I wouldn't wait around too much. And then once we establish, yes, this is Braxton Hicks contraction, yes, what you're feeling is not changing your cervix, then, you know, check in with us. If you're having them, if they change in nature <coughs> in any sort of way, then, you know, we take it as, we take it seriously all the time, but then the patient knows, okay, this is what I was feeling last week, same thing. I'll rest, I'll, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if, you know, subtle changes in how she's feeling um, should be followed up on right away. So we have a variation of early onset labor. We have actual preterm labor. And then um, we have premature rupture of membranes. But we have preterm premature rupture of membranes. Premature rupture of membranes is simply uh, the water breaks and labor doesn't start, but the water breaks, all right? Preterm premature rupture of membranes is the water breaks, labor doesn't happen, but sh we don't want her to have a water broken yet because that biscuit ain't done cooking, right? <clears throat> so, preterm labor is uterine contractions and cervical changes, all right? That is preterm labor. 
And that happens between the 20th and 37th week gestation. Why does it happen? Well, gosh, if we only knew, <clears throat> right? A baby would never be born preterm again if we only knew the exact cause of preterm labor. Sometimes we have a pretty good idea that it could be infection, um, that she, has, she just has too much going on in her uterus. Hydramnios or polyhydramnios is an overabundance of amniotic fluid. So her uterus is stretched a little bit more than maybe um, is uh, comfortable for the uterus. And the uterus starts contracting because it thinks it's supposed to. <laughs> um, more than one kid in there. Again, we got a uterus that is stretched beyond what is reasonable and now is starting to rebel. Uh, for some reason, age of less than 17 or above 35 is a risk factor. Um, if they've done this preterm birth thing before, that might uh, be the problem. So we'll get into that a little bit. Low socioeconomic status. I don't think it's the actual um, numbers on their paycheck. I think it's the stress and the lifestyle um, that goes along with a low socioeconomic status. In, in terms of nutrition, stre uh, stress, right? That's my guess. Uh, smoking, substance use, domestic violence, all, all of that. <coughs> all right. These are some more risk factors for preterm labor. All the diabetes and hypertension and all that. Lack of prenatal care. Again, um, maybe she's not taking the best care of herself. She might be from a, um, a low socioeconomic status <coughs> with the stresses going along with it. <coughs> some, other, some other stuff. P-prom, that's the preterm, pre premature rupture membranes. Short intervals between pregnancies. Maybe the uterus forgot that there was even a break in there, and maybe just <laughs> started thinking, "Oh, whoa, we're still, oh, we're still having a baby here. Let's do this over again." I know. This might, might be the time that we find some uterine abnormalities as well that that um, like lead to an angry uterus. <coughs> sometimes it's not that. Um, sometimes it's, it's fairly subtle, <clears throat> and it might be uh, just a persistent low backache. You're at 67 minutes. I don't know if you want to be starting that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just realized. 